I'm joined today by Max Howell, who for many of you doesn't need any introduction. Max created Homebrew, the package manager in 2012. It now has 13,000 GitHub stars, 300 plus contributors. Uh, it's you know arguably one of the most successful open source projects around. And today it's outlived his influence. I, I believe I understand there's kind of a team who maintains uh, Homebrew and, and Max is on to other projects, including uh, what he's here to talk to us about today. He's now the CEO of T, uh, T.XYZ. Um, and, and we'll get into what that is in just a moment, but I understand it's employing you know blockchain and the like to help developers uh, stake their open source efforts and maybe get a, um, a return on them. Max, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for inviting me here. This is kind of like one of those you know exciting moments where you you see one of your heroes in life and 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 uh, you know, get butterflies in your your tummy. <laughs> uh, I, I, a lot of us, myself included, uh, one of our first interactions with software as a programmer was with Homebrew, and so it's fun to have you on the show. Tell us first what T is, so that as, as an audience we all understand what we're talking about, and then of course we'll go into a lot of history and how we got here. Uh, sure, although I first say. I just want to say that I, I get that um, hero worship myself all the time when I meet uh, various high profile people from the software industry and open source. And uh, I think, you know, you never expect to become one of those people yourself. And certainly uh, I never did. Uh, so, yeah, we're we're just regular sorts. Um, so, well, T is brew too, essentially. I stopped working on homebrew in about 2015, 2016 or so and gradually petered out altogether on it. Mostly stopped working on it due to burnout. It was a huge project. Still is, obviously, an enormous project. And for many years, uh, I was the main person working on it, like not to downplay who the other people who worked on it, like Mike McQuaid, who still is the lead uh, on Homebrew. He did an enormous amount of work. But for a lot of that initial period, building the community up, making it into a large project, like I was the driving force behind that. And that was exhausting, especially because I had a full-time job otherwise in order to pay the bills most of the time. So I quit in like 2015, 2016 or so. And uh, like since then, I you know compulsively wrote notes about what I would do to brew to improve it. Because uh, in the first place, like, I made brew because it was something I needed personally. I was working at a company and we needed a tool that was better than the package management solutions we had, especially to try and like work in a cross-platform manner. And uh, so I built it for me and for my team and then it turned out a lot of other people needed it. And uh, so in the years since I stopped working on Brew directly, I still used Brew and I still could see how it could be better. And I imagined ideas for what it could be. But people would ask me, are you going to make another one? I was like, nah, because like, never in my life have I done a sequel to something I've built. Uh, usually I do it once and I'm like, that was fun. And uh, I move on to the next thing that takes my interest. And I've worked in a lot of different industries. Uh, and uh, well, you know, all mostly software, mostly. Um, but a lot, a lot of different varieties of it. And uh, like in my own time, I work on loads of different things. And that, that's part of the reason that I've always enjoyed open source is because you can just dabble in like all sorts of different things. So I didn't think I'd do it again. But last year, like my old friend, Timothy Lewis, who I met in Chicago in 2013 or so, uh, quite old friends now, we've uh, matured together. And uh, he, he's been trying to get me into crypto stuff for years. And like a lot of people, I didn't really see the appeal because I, I deliberately didn't go into finance, right? <laughs> I, I could have, I have a lot of friends who went into finance. I wanted to build stuff. And so I didn't see that there was the possibility with what crypto was building over the last 10 years longer. Uh, they were building something more than that. And so um, last year I was in between jobs and I wasn't sure what I was going to be doing. And then uh, me and my girlfriend got pregnant, which was deliberate. And uh, we just thought it would take a lot longer. <laughs> so suddenly I woke up one day, like very soon after we started trying and realized that I didn't have a steady job right now. I didn't know what I was doing with my life and I needed something secure to uh, help raise a family with. And, uh, you know, I, I was used to like being able to dabble in open source and it didn't matter if it didn't pay a lot. And then doing contracts here and there and like finding startups every now and again that took my fancy and so working on that. And uh, I, yeah, 
So open source wasn't going to cut it for sure. And so I was thinking along the lines of like, okay, how can I make the open source I'm working on pay the bills? Like the age old problem with open source, right? Like for 30 years, open source has been building the internet. And yet the people who work on it famously like don't often get paid. And if they do, they don't get paid well. Or if they do get paid well, it's because Google or Facebook or Microsoft basically own that piece of open source. And they have like yeah, uh, undue amount of influence on how that project is run and unfolds. Uh, so I went back and started looking at what could be done. I looked through all my ideas and uh, I came across Brew 2 in my ideas selection. And uh, then I had a call with Tim and he turned me onto Web3, as they were calling it now. And I saw this connection, like suddenly that evening, uh, the package manager is like this uniquely placed tool. Like it sits underneath all developer tools. It sits underneath uh, the entire open source ecosystem. And we map out the entire open source ecosystem. We know exactly how all the open source projects in the graph are connected to each other, all the way down to yeah. the kernel. Although we don't obviously compile the kernel uh, usually, uh, these sort of tools, but we could, like it's something I'm considering for the future. So if you understand that, <laughs> Brew three. You know, uh, yeah. <laughs> like you could, uh, you could use that graph to uh, direct money in some manner to that to those mm -hmm. people. And so the, the obvious choice was token, some kind of token on the blockchain, because then it's automated. Then the fees are manageable. The fees are something you control, and you can do fancy stuff with it. And so we spent the last nine months devising how exactly we're going to do that, and we believe that we have come up with a unique way to remunerate the entire open source ecosystem as well as creating a kick-ass package manager that is the successor to Homebrew and that is going to uh, do new things, things that people haven't really thought of before. So, yeah, that's T. Back up on a couple of things. Uh, Tim, you were talking to Tim. Who's Tim? And, and then when you said, where, you know, maybe you can tell us about the T team today. So I met Tim in Chicago about, uh, that was 2013, I think. And uh, we worked on a few projects together and tried to f start a few companies together. And uh, he went off after Chicago and got into crypto. And I went off after Chicago and went and worked at Apple for a year, uh, which is a, a whole interesting story by itself related to that famous Google tweet, uh, which uh, changed a few things for me. And for, for the audience, this is the tweet where you talked about your interview experience at Google? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we, we always kept in contact. We worked on a few things together. And uh, he became like quite famous in the crypto community and the Web3 community. And so he's been trying to get me into this stuff for years. And like most people, I, I didn't see what it was. And I think people are only just starting to see that it's more than just money, that you're yeah. building on top of money, making it programmable. Uh, it's like the next step in what the internet can be when money is something that isn't controlled and can be flexible and can be programmed. Like you can do all sorts of interesting things with digital contracts. And like admittedly, most of the uses that people are doing right now is just de decentralized finance. And people like harp on about the decentralization as though obviously you should understand why you want everything to be decentralized. And I'm like most people, uh, decentralization sounds nice, but it's not, not be all and end all for me, not mm -hmm. at all, but yeah. it is powerful when used correctly. But so as a result, like most of what people see in like Web3 and crypto is just like a bunch of people trying to make a load of money, a lot of scams, a lot of like, why, why do I need this? Uh, the utility use cases are only just starting to emerge. And I think T is going to be an excellent example of what the utility of Web3 can be uh, once, once we go live with it. Yeah, certainly agree with you that the programmable money do, is extremely enticing. And I'm glad you can kind of separate the value there from decentralized in general, because I agree that, you know, there's pros and cons to centralization and decentralization. And um, but programmable money is just uh, strictly cooler than, than non-programmable money. Um, oh, yeah. So uh, good, good uh, clarity there. And, and then um, before, yeah, before we get to the team, you were saying something about, yeah, maybe you can tell us exactly how T works um, or, or yeah. maybe not how it works, but what it, what it, maybe tell us a step further about what it is or what you imagine it to be. Yeah, well, I can't tell you exactly how it works yet. Cause um, so we built, uh, we've uh, written the white paper 
So okay. you can't be a crypto project without white paper. Uh, so initially I was like, oh, do we have to be like everyone else? I always cover everything like this. It's like, are we just copying everyone else by making a white paper? Uh, but when once I read a few more of them than the Bitcoin white paper, which everyone should read the Bitcoin white paper, incidentally, because it's really quite ingenious. Like there were some real inventions in there. And like, obviously it's like super enticing how nobody knows who the people or person is who wrote the thing. Incredible. Uh, yeah. So, you know, there's an interesting mystery there. So I read a few more and then I realized that actually by doing that much work up front, you were making it possible for you to do a super complicated thing like write a blockchain and a protocol. And so I was like, okay, let's do it. So we wrote the white paper. So we more or less understand how remuneration will work. And if you want me to go into that, I'd ask you again later. But the uh, the rest, like T is not just a blockchain. And I think this is where a lot of Web3 companies go wrong is that they only have protocol, they only have blockchain. You got to remember that protocol and blockchain is just a piece of technology and it should just be an implementation detail for your users. You have to come at these things with a user-centric mindset. You always, always have to. Whenever you're doing a company, whenever you're doing an open source project. So are our users only going to use a blockchain? No chance. There's no way we could be successful without an excellent kick-ass product suite that is a companion to the protocol. Now, our protocol is essentially a decentralized database for all open source packages. So when you release a package, okay. you'll sign an NFT into our blockchain. There's no JPEG or anything. These aren't the, the scammy JPEG NFTs. This is the, the real what NFTs were meant to be NFTs, i.e. an immutable owned data point in the blockchain that is decentralized and cannot be undone. So uh, it's perfect for a package release. You release package foo version 1.2.3, stick it in the blockchain. There it is forever. And we can use decentralized storage. So all the package uh, tables and binaries can never be, you know, unobtainable. Uh, so, you know, the decentralized stuff has some tangible benefits for security and the robustness of open source in general. But also because it's an owned NFT, we know where to send token. So I'll talk about the remuneration in more detail uh, later. But uh, that protocol is just one part of it. A great decentralized database for all of open source. And we want all open source to be in there, not just like stuff that Homebrew would normally do, right? Not stuff that packages for systems would do. I want NPM to put their packages in there one day. So we're going to build like tools to make it super easy for other package managers or dependency managers to start using our protocol in the long run. But I understand this is a three to four year project, right? But once we've proved the validity of it for our use case, which will be the T package manager, I want all these other things to start using it because it's a human humanitarian effort, what we're doing here. This is for everybody who is a programmer, developer, or open source person, and like people who use the internet. We're trying to robustify, we're trying to make it so it's economically viable for open source to exist, so that people like me don't have to find contract work or full-time jobs every uh, six months in order to continue totally. working on open source. All right, one thing I say regularly is that I can't imagine like what else I could have built, frankly, if I hadn't had to keep chasing the dollar like every six, three to six months. <laughs> and like, the truth is, like, there's a lot of full-time jobs that I worked at, even Apple, like, they probably would sue me, where I was doing open source while I was there. <laughs> so effectively, I had two jobs the whole time. So anyway, the protocol is not owned mm. by the company. The protocol is going to be released as an open source project. The IP will be donated to the world. And T Incorporated is not taking any money. Like, you know, it would be common for like it to be like an app store, right? Apple take 20% of every like transaction that goes through their app store. Well, effectively, we're building an app store for open source here. We're not taking a percentage, we're taking zero. So T yeah. Incorporated has to make money other ways. And like part of the way we're gonna do that is by building this kick-ass product suite. So the product suite is the companion kick-ass package manager. It's gonna do things people haven't really considered for, that a package manager can do before. I'm actively working on that right now. As soon as I get off this podcast, I'm going to go straight back into it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> kind of eager, actually. I'm in the middle of something important. And uh, we're building like uh, a series of extra things around the package manager so that we can like uh, monetize the company, so that we can give things to developers that they need. And T is going to be a very developer-focused patch manager, right? Uh, Homebrew was initially a very developer-focused package manager. Uh, over time, it became user-focused in general. 
doesn't matter what kind of computer user you are, if you're using a Mac or Linux nowadays or even Windows nowadays, like I was pleased to see it cross the platform barriers. That was always the intention. Uh, then uh, Homebrew is a, a great tool for getting like open source software that you might need. And like, it's not just developers who need this stuff. Over the years, I received emails from every profession, pretty much, that uses a computer. Every profession that uses a computer, there is something in that open source bucket where there isn't a good graphical app and you need something like a package manager to get it. Like musicians and architects and scientists, other kinds of engineers. Uh, I got emails from all these kinds of people and like, uh, it was annoying most of the time, frankly. because <laughs> I had a lot of other things to be working on rather than user support. But with my open source, I've always come from the perspective of patience as much as possible. Like you can find great examples of me losing my temper on GitHub. And uh, this has given me a reputation for sure, but it's just like, it's a fame thing. Like once you're re reasonably famous, like every example of bad behavior gets you. Uh, Cause generally, frankly, I'm pretty patient with people because I want to understand their problem so that I can fix the problem and make sure that I don't get that support request again. It really is a selfish uh, like basis. Uh, I remember like with, like some of the first open source I worked on, I worked on this music player called Amarok for Linux, KDE Linux. And uh, it was one of the best projects I've ever worked on, honestly. But I spent hours in the support channel just like figuring out what people's problems were and then hard coding mm -hmm. solutions for that into the build system. Uh, it was always the build system that was the biggest problem so that we wouldn't get that request again. But also because I don't want people to have stuff that's broken. I know that yeah. every time you get a bug report, uh, that's only one in 10 people are going to give you that bug report. There's nine other people you're never going to meet who just gave up on whatever it was yeah. they were using. They're like, nah, screw it. it. This doesn't work. I don't want to use it. And with Homebrew, I came at it with exactly the same perspective. It's part of the reason it was successful. It's like, from the word go, I knew that I needed to help the user to help me to fix the problem. So I built in all this stuff, like uh, whenever there was a bug, uh, whenever it crashed, like. I'd print a huge stack trace and tell them to open a ticket. I'd give them the link so they could open a ticket. I gave them other information I needed and I would search GitHub just in case it had already been reported and give them the uh, uh, any tickets I thought might help them fix the issue so they could go there and communicate, make a community. I'd be a community, make it yeah, so everyone yeah. felt like they were part of making homebrew better. Anyway, I've sort of got off point here. Well, so, so Max, you said something a while back that I think is kind of uh, important. And that was that if we provided a way for people to make money on open source, there would be a whole lot more of it. And, and I think that's, you know, when, when people complain about the open source economy today, so the economist in me is like, well, you know, it's kind of working to an extent. Like yeah. if, if people didn't think that there are incentives for creating open source, and 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 people follow those incentives and some of them get what they were after and, and if they don't they move on to other things and in a way it works but what you're pointing out is that there's all kinds of more software that could be written mm -hmm. um yeah but there's not a business model to incentivize people to write that software in fact when they try to they eventually just give up because it's they're they're working for free and they, they move on to other things but you you pointed out that there's all these other projects you could have pursued if, mm -hmm. if you didn't have to go work on dumb things that had a business model. <laughs> if we can just give a business model for people to build utilities that other developers are gonna benefit from. Um, and, and you're saying T is this medium, you know, uh, Brew is certainly a distribution channel and it's very normal for a distribution channel to also be a, a place to monetize and, and so now you're offering that to the world. That's, that's, um, that's how we set up what we're doing and that is our intention and that is what we're heading towards building so if we don't succeed i'll be extremely upset but that's what we're putting all our energy into making happen and yeah like the truth is there's like anyone who's ever released open source did it for passion and they'd rather be working on that and then they have to stop uh these people should be building the stuff that builds the internet like if you look at the stack of open source uh 90% of pretty much every Web2 company out there, it's, eight, it's open source underneath that. Every big enterprise solution, there's huge amounts of open source. Well, it used to be that they'd try and avoid it. And like Microsoft were a huge one for like trying to avoid it, right? But in the end, they were like, mm -hmm. ah, sod it. Like, how can you avoid it nowadays? And there's no one that isn't. So these people build the stuff that powers the internet. 
And yet, like, they have to either beg a company to hire them so they can work on it. And we want that to stop. I don't... Like, it used to be open source was always maintained by people who had no external pressures that were forcing them to do things that maybe didn't make sense for the project or the community. Uh, I don't like that Facebook, Google, Microsoft hire so many open source people now. But also, we want to make it so that they, these talented engineers at Microsoft, Facebook, and Google aren't working on making ad algorithms or, like encouraging people to click a like button but they're working on like things that genuinely benefit humanity the world and the internet like these are talented people that need uh, a system that incentivizes them to use their talents for what's best for humanity and that that's part of what we're trying to make t able to do and honestly i think we've cracked it people should go read the white paper so let's run that to ground the to get involved, you probably read the right paper. Now you understand at a high level what what he's trying to do. And then is there a place to, to contribute, get involved? Yeah. Uh, so it's still early. Like this is the first time I've made an open source company. And, uh, you know, it's it's it has been difficult. It's been a lot easier in the last few years. The idea of commercial open source has really started to become a thing. But, you know, I, I couldn't successfully do it before. I remember some VC phoned me after Homebrew had been out a few years and it was getting up to like tens of millions of users at that point. It was like, how can we monetize this? And I was like, it's too late, mate. <laughs> you called me four <laughs> years ago. Ship like, sailed. what can we do yeah. now? <laughs> Um, so, you know, we've done it in the right order, but as a result, like usually I wouldn't have had any discussion about what I was working on yet. Whenever I do open source, I do it without telling anyone, maybe a few hints on my Twitter here and there. And then when it's ready, I release it. So it's not ready and I haven't released it. So yeah. people can't Good. really get involved yet. Uh, we no, have a discord. Can... Yep. So we, we've got a discord. You can go to the discord and, uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not great on the discord yet. That's partly because we haven't really got anything out there. Like our white paper's open source. And uh, you should go and check it out because I've built this hugely awesome build pipeline for turning Markdown into, uh, you know, what looks like a normal PDF using loads of open source, obviously. And uh, our website is open source because, like, I want everything we do to be open source, every single part of it. So, yeah, uh, you can check those out, but, you know, you can't really contribute yet. Good. Now, you also said something about, you know, these open source folks have to go get a job and, and often those jobs are at big tech and they get paid for doing dumb things. T tell us about your experience interviewing at Google and, and I'm curious <laughs> to actually hear the follow-up, yeah. you know, how, how that, that tweet, you said it changed your life. Yeah, well, it's no doubt it was a pivotal moment. Um, so, okay, I was in Chicago and uh, I didn't know what to do with myself next. Um, I'd uh, recently uh, handed Homebrew over to the community by uh, transferring the uh, repo from my username to the Homebrew organization, which uh, took me about 12 hours of uh, painful deliberation to do, I have to say. I remember uh, I had the page open and there was a button on the page that was like, transfer. And uh, <laughs> it, it, there was like, are you sure? And then a button, okay. And I showed it to one of my coworkers at the time. I was working at a boot camp. And I said, should I do it? And he said, Max, there is no way you should do this. Are you insane? <laughs> uh, and then like five minutes after that, I did it. Because I realized that I was only not doing it for my own ego. And, uh, you know, I enjoyed having it on my username. At the time, it, Homebrew was the biggest uh, open source project on GitHub by every metric. Uh, and uh, it made me feel good. But I knew that, you know, my uh, effort had been uh, reducing over time. Uh, and my motivation was waning and like, I needed to hand it over to the community. Like there was loads of people who turned up who were doing a really great job, better than I was doing at that point. So I'd done that and I was like, what am I going to do with my life now? So I asked my wife at the time and she said, why don't you reply to one of those emails that Google always sends you? Because, you know, they've been sending me recruit emails since Homebrew had become popular, uh, successful, yeah. and well used. Uh, I'd always ignored them because I never thought I wanted to work somewhere like Google. And I was right, turns out. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I replied and the recruiter phoned me and he said, well, okay, like based on um, your status, we're going to skip the phone interview and send you straight in for in-person interviews. I said, uh, well, okay. And, he, and then I asked it, I said, look, you know, I haven't got a computer science degree, right? And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, that won't be a problem. Your interviews will be catered to you. And so he lied. Um, 
because uh, like you know i i knew the google interviews were heavy computer science uh but i don't have computer science i have a chemistry degree i was going to be a scientist i was always going to be a scientist and i did one year of chemistry and sc- discovered that it was really boring and i didn't want to do it yeah <laughs> so i found open source and the rest is history um so i went in for interview and the first interview i had was the binary tree question and like i don't think it was actually a binary tree question with hindsight um it was uh, so, something I figured it out and then I went home and I tried to figure out how to do it and I figured it out using Google, obviously. I wanted to prove to myself yeah. I could do the thing. It was uh, array based, um, sort of binary tree because like you had two nodes for everything, but yeah, I don't really remember at this point. Um, yeah, so I had that. And then uh, at the end of the interview, I said, so, uh, you know, um, you don't actually use this stuff, right? At Google, I don't know why I said this. And she said, I use it all the time. And uh, her her attitude was one of, uh, I'm not going to let you get this job, <laughs> as far as I can tell. I don't think it was just her. I had seven interviews that day in a lunch interview. They don't, they don't have to lay them on. And, uh, you know, I think half of them thought that I'd be a good fit, and the other half didn't. And in the end, they decided no. But I don't want to, you know, Google don't deserve the shit they got for it. It's one of those typical viral tweets, right? They phoned me up the next week, and told me I didn't get it. And so I just immediately went to Twitter and I was like, blah, 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 because I was like a little bit annoyed about it, even though I sort of right. went back in my mind and never thought that I was going to take the job anyway, even, you know, wasn't sure. Um, and at the time, I only had like a thousand followers on Twitter, so I didn't expect anything to happen. Right. But like 20 minutes later, my friend calls me and is like, where do you think your tweet is on Hacker News? I'm like, oh, God. So I went to Hacker News, and there, right at the top is Max Howe didn't get him hired at Google. Tell them to fuck off. <laughs> I was like, Jesus. I was like, should I delete this? I almost deleted it. Um, and then, like, by the end of the day, I would open up the Twitter app, and I could scroll, and it, the whole screen would fill with new uh, reactions to the tweet. And then I'd scroll wow. again. It was immediately new reactions. It was going insane. At this point, I think it's had, like, 3 million views or something over the years. It still gets retweeted as though it happened yesterday. This was 2015. <laughs> so quite some time Amazing. ago. So the, 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 um, the reaction from the internet was predictable. Um, you know, like, I should be able to invert a binary tree. What the hell am I doing? Uh, or, no, no, he's proved himself. He doesn't need to invert a binary tree. But my attitude still is... Uh, I don't need much computer science and I've managed to make things that are significant. When I do need computer science, I look it up on Google and I implement it. Like I can, just because I can't do these puzzles spontaneously for me doesn't make any difference. And so whenever I hire staff, I don't, I don't give them those kinds of puzzles. And Google supposedly changed how they do interviews because of this tweet. Like supposedly there was a town hall and they talked about it. And uh, to Google's credit, another department then offered me a job. But I also yeah, wow. had 230 other offers of jobs in my inbox. <laughs> yeah, so that was why it was like life-changing. And like one of them was Apple. And so I went to work at Apple. Because, you know, my hero worshipped Apple. And uh, it turns out all you have to do is work there for a year. And uh, after that, you no longer want anything to do with them. So... Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I went to work at Apple, and uh, you know, because I've always been a big fan. You know. Yeah. Um, not always, actually. You know, I thought they were stupid, like everyone else did during the nineties. And uh, it was only when they released the Intel Mac Mini, I, I became interested. I was like, oh, okay, so this this thing is like proper now. It runs a proper processor, and uh, I I fell in love with OS X for many reasons. So working at Apple seemed like a dream come true, but um, I worked there a year and uh, I it, it didn't go well. No. Okay. And now you found your true home, maybe back back doing brew too. Yeah. Well, the truth is, I'm too entrepreneurial. Uh, I like doing my own stuff, and uh, I don't like slow down. Big companies have slow down, and that was the worst thing about Apple for me is that they wouldn't let me work the way I work. Like they wouldn't let me be efficient. I had to, uh, there was too much process. Well, I get it. You know. like, wh- why the fuck, why would I, sh- why should I expect to be treated differently? But, well, they did imply I would be. 
Well, how do you work, Max? Well, I mean, what, what does that mean? Uh, you couldn't work the way you work. Yeah. Um, so over the years, I've just developed a lot of strategies for being efficient. As far as I'm concerned, uh, I give myself like a task to finish by the end of the day or the end of midweek or the end of the week. And I realize when I'm not making enough progress and I know how to cut, I know how to like reevaluate like my approach. I know when to give up on stuff and throw it away. And as a result, I always meet my targets. Um, at Apple, it was impossible for me to work that way. They were like, you can't do that. We need to review everything every step of the way or, uh, you know, very reasonable mm. requ requests. Yeah. yeah. But I found it very depressing being forced into that bucket, having never before having been pushed into that bucket. Uh, now I get like, you, you know, you work at a company, you can't be that way. So I don't really blame them. And like, chances are I would have huh. been similar at Google maybe. Right. But for me, 10x engineering is about efficiency. Well, I don't really consider myself a 10x engineer because I don't really like the term. But the truth is, I get things done a lot faster than most people. And it's just like I know how to work. And so they wouldn't let me. No, this idea of, of never missing deadlines, and you know, instead of pushing deadlines to fit the scope of the of the plan, you adjust the scope to fit the deadlines as, as you work. You know, I don't make my staff do that, although I do encourage results, got results driven development, essentially. Um, but at T, um, at least in the engineering department and the product teams, there's no set working hours. But I want a global team anyway, so that makes sense. I want someone in every time zone. But I'm like, I don't care when you work or how much you work, as long as you deliver on time. So, uh, you know, I haven't just said I don't force it. Like, you know, I don't get upset if they don't deliver on time, but there's a high expectation that you try. And like, I, t I tutor them on how to go about it using my strategy, but I know that my strategy works for me. It's not going to work for everybody. You have to figure out your own. You have to figure out how it works. Sure. But I think it's reasonable to have kind of company values that, that generally everyone agrees on and aspires to. And on-time delivery seems like a reasonable one. Uh, what uh let's go back to the team so we, we tabled that for a moment um so you were gonna you reached out to tim and, and you kind of came up with some of this together or at least he was in the early days and and then others joined yeah i called him up i was like i want to build brew 2 with a blockchain component so that somehow we figure out how to redistribute token to the top of the stack and all the dependencies. And this was the key, right? Because nowadays, especially, you can do sponsorship and bounties for an open source project if you want. Now, I yep. I don't particularly like them, and so I've never really done them myself because I feel that uh, you have to chase the sponsorship and bounties and like do what, you know, then you're introducing some agenda into how the project works. But either way, the fact of the matter is sponsorship and bounties only reward the top of the stack, the favorites. And there's tens of thousands of open source projects. Like Log4j was a great example of this in December. You remember the incident, there was a zero day in this Java library called Log4j. And uh, it turned out a, a shit ton of enterprise solutions used this library and were instantly rootable. And no one really ever heard of it. Typical Nebraska problem, that's what we call it. The Nebraska problem is based on the XKCD comic and uh, it's the dependency tree, the tower. Right at the bottom is that tiny little column holding the whole internet up, and it's maintained by this guy from Nebraska. Yeah. Thanklessly, and uh, that was, and Log4j was a Nebraska project. So suddenly they had all this attention, all of it negative, all of it abusive, frankly. Like, not everyone's abusive yeah. on the internet, but like most people, if they feel anonymous or enough, will be, is the truth of it, especially on platforms that can't control it. Uh, and yeah, like they don't get any funding and I wonder if they still do now that they fixed it and everyone's just moved on. So anyway, the idea was use blockchain, use open, uh, the open source dependency tree because the package manager knows the whole tree and like people are incentivized to maintain that correctly. We can distribute the token all the way down. So I phoned him up. I was like, yeah, okay, this is the idea. Came to me a moment of inspiration last night, had a little weed, I have to confess. And, uh, it just popped into my head. The moment it popped into my head, I woke up my girlfriend who was like three weeks pregnant at that point. And I was like, I just had what I think is a brilliant idea. And she was like, what is it? Well, I told her. And then the next day she couldn't remember this at all. <laughs> the first person I told about it. Uh, so I told him and he was like, oh, okay. 
I'll get back to you. I was like, is that it? <laughs> yeah. A week later, he was flying me out to meet some people and like that's when we formed the company. So we're about okay. 13 or 14 people at this point and we're still hiring. Like, I need more developers. I need uh, people who can help me with the package manager, specifically, like, I very much need someone who can help me with Windows for the package manager. But also, we're building out, you know, I, I keep saying it's going to be different. It is different. Um, I don't really want to spoil it. I think it's doing some really exciting and transformative things. Like, essentially, I'm trying to make the idea of package manager uh, even more of an implementation detail. Uh, and uh, making packaging essentially programmable so that people can write, like it, essentially making packaging mm. into a set of primitives so that you can build entirely new things with a set of like well-defined primitives for packaging that can install all the base, like, you know, you can write scripts for this thing where it's like, okay, I want to use uh, Node and I want to use uh, OpenSSL and I want to use uh, Rust and uh, I want uh, GPG. And uh, the script will just install the shit for you in a sandbox. Yeah. And then you can program with that stuff. Everything has well-defined APIs. Anyway, so I'm spoiling it. So so it's it's composable to a degree. Um, and and I, I don't I mean, I, I've come across Nix some, which I is, is tricky to use, but, but Nix maybe has some of that flavor, I wonder. But Nix... It should be way more successful than it is because it's doing some yeah. of these things. Yeah. They fail at the user experience. User experience Got is it. like beyond bad, like worse than Docker. <laughs> worse than Docker, as far as I'm concerned, is like... Uh, so, like, uh, I can't even be bothered to use the thing, even though it's powerful. So, sorry, yeah. Nick, so uh, I'm planning to replace you. Good. <laughs> and you've got... Um... You've got this bright team to do it. Got it. 13 people. Uh, not quite Here in every time zone yet, but that's the goal. No. We're still too America-centric, yeah. and that's just what happens, right? I live in America now. I've lived here for 10 years. Uh, North Carolina at the moment. I've been all over. Uh, very much enjoying the triangle there in North Carolina. If you live nearby, please give me a, a call. I want to meet interesting people. Been here about a year. Um, so, you know, it's typical, your network is the people you've met and like, typically that's in your country, but I, I want someone in every time zone. So we're actively looking outside of the America or well, North America at least. Um, but yeah, so hopefully 20 by the end of the year, need more devs. Uh, and so, you know, uh, feel free to check our website. Does that have some practical purpose like you know somebody's on support somebody's available any hour the, the company's always running or or is it more um some other idea like it's just kind of cool to cover the globe there's several reasons right primarily um primarily let's be honest i think it's cool uh yeah. secondarily <laughs> uh open source is global yeah. open source is not america centric so with T, I'm planning to release it with translations to as many languages as I can have. Like it's very rare that command line tools do this and translate everything. And we've got a translation process in place for the white paper. So if you want, and it's semantically versioned, it's, it's lovely. Oh, yeah, that's right. I, I gush about how we're doing this. Um, so, uh, you know, like we've had a lot of interest from uh, India and Russia. And I love that. I want the people to be uh, getting actively involved from other cultures uh open source is meant to help everybody and not just the americas and like it's become more and more american centric since i've been in it like when i started in open source kde uh this desktop environment for linux if you never heard of it uh was mostly based in europe nowadays there's not much open source which is mostly based in europe or asia or australia that things have gone wrong well, it follows the money. It follows incentives. Yeah. Like, it's the way it's become more corporate. And like, yeah. so we're deliberately with T going to try and push it out of that. Like I say, I want people at Facebook to quit and work on open source full time. That's, that's yeah. like the golden model. Imagine the future. Oh, good. Max, this has been a fascinating conversation. What, what have we not covered that we wanted to get to today or that you wanted to get to? Um, I think we covered everything I want to get to. Like we didn't discuss how the remuneration works, uh, but that's fine. Go and read the white paper. Well, it's a staking model, and uh, there, you know, if you don't know how 
proof of stake works, it makes it a little more difficult to make it sound like it's going to work. But like, uh, mm -hmm. proof of stake allows you to, uh, reward the people in the ecosystem without like doing energy intensive, uh, proof of mm -hmm. work calculations. And so some of those people in the ecosystem were rewarding is the open source maintainers, the people who own these NFTs that they put in the tree. That's the basics of it. But the white paper goes into a lot of detail. It's got a pretty good abstract. I go and read that. Awesome. Max, pleasure to have you on the show. There's so many good things to cover in this. We're gonna have a hard time writing a summary and, and uh, bubbling it up for everyone, but we're gonna do our best. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks for having me. I had a lovely time. You can subscribe to the podcast and check out our community Slack and newsletter at contributor.fyi. If you like the show, please leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Until next time, I'm Eric Anderson, and this has been Contributor. Contributor.